Before the invention of sound recording, the only way to experience music was to do so live. That began to change in the 1850s when French printer Edouard Leon Scott de Martinville experimented with sound recording. His idea was to photograph the word with a device called a phonotograph. Using a hogshead hair bristle as a needle, de Martinville tied one end of the needle to a thin membrane stretched over a narrow part of the funnel. When he spoke into the wide part of the funnel, the membrane vibrated and the bristle's free end made grooves on a revolving cylinder coated with a thick liquid. De Martinville did not intend for phonograms to be played back. Instead, he intended for the device's waves to be read by humans as one would read text. Sound recordings moved from the development phase into the entrepreneurial phase when Thomas Edison determined how to both record sounds and play them back. Edison recorded his own voice by creating a machine that played a foil cylinder. Called the phonograph, it was named for the Greek words for sound and writing. Edison patented the phonograph as a type of answering machine. About a decade later, Chinchester Bell and Charles Sumner Tainter improved upon Edison's invention with their graphophone, which played more durable wax cylinders. Neither invention was very successful as a voice recording office machine, but eventually began to produce cylinders with pre-recorded music and laid the foundation for more viable sound recording technology. While Edison's phonograph established his international reputation as an inventor, it was German immigrant Emil Berliner who brought sound recording into the mass medium stage. Berliner developed a turntable machine called a gramophone that played flat discs, called records, made of shellac. Berliner also discovered how to mass produce records from a master recording, which could then be stamped in the center with the label listing the song title, performer, and songwriter. By the early 1900s, the Victrola record player from the Victor Talking Machine Company was widely available for home use. Hand-cranked Victrolas were gradually replaced with electric record players as more U.S. homes were wired for electricity. Recorded music initially had little appeal owed to poor sound quality and only three to four minutes of music available per record. When shellac was needed to help make weapons during World War II, the record industry turned to polyvinyl plastic. These vinyl records, called 78s, because they turned at 78 revolutions per minute, or RPM, they were less noisy and more durable than their shellac counterparts. The better quality translated to better sales. By the 1950s, a 33 and a third RPM long playing record was able to hold 20 minutes of music per side, while smaller 45 RPM records were used for singles. The two major record producers at the time, CBS Records and RCA Victor, compromised to design players that could accommodate both record formats. The advent of audio tape and tape players in the 1940s paved the way for cassettes and digital recording. Invented in 1931, stereo sound was put to commercial use in 1958, allowing for two separate channels of sound. Using audio tape, recording engineers could record multiple instrumental and vocal tracks and then mix them down to two stereo tracks, thus creating a more natural sound. By the mid 1960s, Engineers shrunk down bulky reel-to-reel -reel recordings, putting them inside small plastic cases and developing portable cassette players. For the first time, music became portable. Audio tape also permitted for home dubbing, which enables music fans to create their own mixtapes of their favorite songs. The biggest recording advancement came in the 1970s with digital audio recording. Analog recording captures the fluctuation of sound waves and stores the signals in a record's grooves or a tape's continuous stream of magnetized particles. Digital recording, however, translates sound waves into binary on-off pulses 
and stores that information as a numerical code of ones and zeros. By 1983, Sony and Philips began selling digitally recorded compact discs, which were produced more cheaply than vinyl and cassettes. By then, cassettes and vinyl were nearly obsolete in favor of CDs, although there remains a market for vinyl enthusiasts. The creation of the MP3 file format in 1992 brought sound recording into the digital turn, as sound could now be compressed into small, manageable digital files. By the mid-1990s, computer users were swapping MP3 music files online through peer-to-peer -peer file sharing services like Napster. Unfortunately for music companies and artists, this meant fans could easily get copies of songs without paying for them. By 2001, the U.S. Court of Appeals sided with the music industry and decided that free music file sharing violated music copyrights. The MP3 didn't go away, though. Apple launched its iTunes Store in 2003 to accompany the release of its iPod. By 2011, the music industry was making more money from digital downloads than from the sales of CDs and other physical media. Then came music streaming, like Spotify, Apple Music, Google Play Music, Amazon Music, and Pandora. Streaming is the music industry's best means for controlling the music it sells, with a shift from music ownership to music access. Users pay a monthly fee to access seemingly unlimited music or access it for free by listening to advertising. While sound recording and radio developed independently, their past and future are intertwined. Radio represented Recorded Sound's first major competitor. In 1914, the performance rights organization, ASCAP, the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers, was formed to collect copyright fees for music publishers and writers. In the 1920s, radio stations began launching across the country, using newly available electric record players to broadcast recorded music without compensating the music industry. ASCAP accused radio of hurting the sales of records and sheet music. After all, why would you pay for a record when you could hear it for free on the radio? By 1925, ASCAP established music rights fees for radio, charging between 250 and 2,500 a week to play recorded music. Keeping in mind the radio industry was less than a decade old, Many stations didn't have the revenues to pay the fees and went off air. Other stations hired live in-house orchestras to play music, thus skirting the copyright fees. Meanwhile, 1929 brought about the Great Depression and record sales continued to fall. When television came along in the early 1950s, the radio and recording industries joined forces against their new common enemy the two formulated a plan to supply radio with recorded music as a cheap source of content and allowed record industries greater profits. Radio stations adopted a new hit song format called Top 40, based on the songs most played on bar jukeboxes. Now, when listeners heard their favorite songs on the radio, they went out and purchased their own copy. The recording industry and radio got along well for decades, until the early 2000s, when radio began streaming music online. As they did in the 1920s, the recording industry pushed for high royalty fees for streaming music and hindered the development of internet radio. Popular streaming services ended up developing separately from traditional radio stations.